Google DeepMind CEO, Dennis Hassabis, did an interview on the Google DeepMind podcast, and he basically outlined a philosophical and scientific roadmap for the future of AI. So Hassabis touched on a lot of stuff in this episode, but basically was arguing that the path to AGI requires moving beyond language models to world models, and those are systems capable of simulating physical cause and effect. He posits also that if the human mind is, in fact, computable, AGI could serve as a comparative simulation to isolate unique human traits like creativity and emotion. And also looking forward, he warns that the transition to AGI will likely be, in his words, 10 times bigger and happen 10 times faster than the Industrial Revolution. He also said DeepMind is currently allocating half of its resources to scaling, and half to the pure innovation needed to bridge the gap to something like AGI. So, Paul, I know longtime Demis watchers here on the pod, but what did you take away from this conversation? I think it was their last episode in their series for the year. Yeah, the deep, so Hannah Fry is amazing. Professor Hannah Fry is a brilliant mathematician, uh, author. She's you know wonderful book, um, and she does a great job with this series. I think this was their fifth season, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so I've always been a huge fan of the Deep Mind series. Great to go back and listen to these episodes. Um, a few that I'll highlight that jumped out at me. I actually listened to this twice. Um, once <laughs> just listening, and the second taking notes while I was listening. Um, so he touched on this idea of jagged intelligence, which we hear Ethan Mollick is is he may have been the first one I think to coin like this idea of jagged intelligence. And the basic premise there is that we have this like PhD level AI at times. There's like things you could use Gemini for that you're like, okay, I am at PhD or beyond in its capabilities. And then there's other things like it's not even at a high school level. Like it'll mm -hmm. just make stupid mistakes. And that jagged intelligence is really what prevents them from having confidence like, okay, we are at or very, very close to true AGI until we solve this jaggedness, I guess. He talked about different dimensions of progress. One was consistency, meaning it's like error rate drops dramatically, reasoning and thinking, you know, which we touched on already. Um, and then he got into large language models. Uh, he said like they basically start with all of human knowledge and then you try and compress it down. And so I'll just I'll read an excerpt here because this relates to one of the dimensions we talked about. He said, I think the main issue at the moment is we don't know how to use those systems in a reliable way uh, fully yet in the way we did with AlphaGo. So they touched on AlphaGo. We talked about that in a recent episode, the, the AlphaGo documentary. Um, but of course, that was a lot easier because it was a game. So in AlphaGo, there was like these known outcomes. There was known what you're trying to achieve, whereas language models are sort of meant to be general and solving many things at once. He said, I think once you have AlphaGo, um, you could go back just like we did in the Alpha series and do an Alpha Zero where it starts discovering knowledge for itself. So he's saying these language models are programmed through training processes and they don't really discover anything new on their own, but we could probably get to that point where we can have an alpha zero like uh, model that starts to learn on its own. He said, I think that would be the next step, but that's obviously harder. And so I think it's good to try and create the first step with some kind of alpha go like system. And then when we think about an alpha zero like system, meaning it starts and learns on its own. Um, but that is also one of the things missing from today's systems that it's the ability to uh, learn and continually learn. So learn online and continually learn. So we train these systems, we balance them, we post train them, and then they're out in the world, but they don't continue to learn out in the world like we would. So this is that continual learning idea I shared earlier. And, and then he finished, I, I think that's another critical missing piece for these systems that will be needed for AGI. He touched briefly on the scaling laws and throughout the year, there was different people saying, oh, they're slowing down or we hit a wall. He said, I, I think we've never really seen any wall of ourselves. He said, there might be some diminishing returns, but you're not going to like double every year, you know, continually, but that doesn't mean progress is necessarily slowing. Um, you mentioned the research focus, and this is one of the areas where he's very confident in DeepMind's ability over others is that they, they can continue to invest heavily in research while productizing these models and introducing them in the world where someone like an open AI is having to divert a lot of its, what would be, you know, kind of mid and long-term research efforts to focus on, you know, trying to figure out how to make money so that they, you know, can keep raising more money. So they, and again, Demis talks with such humility, but it's yeah. just like stating facts. It's like, hey, we have an advantage here. Like we're not <laughs> sacrificing the long-term innovation for productization. We're doing both well. Um, one interesting thing uh, Hannah Fry asked about is this idea of 
like in AlphaGo, when you know it's winning at the game of Go, it had this ability to have a confidence score in its decision making. And this mm. actually goes back to even IBM Watson back in 2011 when I first started studying AI. It was a similar concept where the AI had a confidence level of its its uh, feeling that the probability of what it was going to do was correct. And so she asked about the idea, could language models have that? Like, could they actually have a confidence score that would actually enable them to like reduce hallucinations? And he seemed that that was like a viable thing. Um, world models and simulations, he spent a ton of time talking about that. Uh, and that was you know fundamental to eventually having these universal agents he would envision um, that understands cause and effect and the mechanics of the world. It can intuit about physics and things like that. Uh, got into AI bubble. He said it's overhyped in the short term, possibly, but it's still underhyped in the medium and long term, which I agree 100% with. I think yeah. that's the thing a lot of economists miss and investors miss. Startup funding, again, with all humility, sort of taking some some veiled shots at like these labs. He's like, well, it's possible there's some bubbles where they're raising tens of millions of dollars in valuations for basically nothing. They have no sustainable <laughs> business model. I don't think he was specifically talking about open AI at this point, but just that yes, there's definitely a bubble when it comes to that kind of stuff. But then he got into uh, Google's strength, which we've talked a lot about throughout the year. So he said, if there's a retrenchment, meaning like maybe there is a little bit of bubble and things pull back, he said, that's fine. <laughs> I think we're in a great position because we have our own stack with TPUs, their custom chips. We also have all these incredible Google products and the profits that all that um, makes to plug in our AI into. And we're doing that with search. It's totally revolutionized by our overviews, AI mode. With Gemini under the hood, we're looking at Google Workspace, at email, at YouTube. And so there's all these amazing things, including Chrome, where they're building this in and like they have a wildly successful, profitable business that even if there's this like, you know, again, retrenchment, um, he feels pretty good about where they're at. Touched on Nano Banana and, and the role that maybe plays in their path to AGI. And it's always interesting when they talk about sort of unexpected outcomes from these models that, yeah. that even they are surprised sometimes by what these things are capable of doing. Um, got into the industrial revolution and, and how, you know, how that stuff happened and maybe the parallels to AI. And I think, you know, we'll talk a little bit about with Shane Legg had some similar concepts, which is basically like, it's going to be 10 times bigger, 10 times faster. So yes, we can learn from that, but, um, this is going to happen so much faster. And that we have to, as a society, really start talking more about these things and trying to figure out how we can work through this um, because he's very optimistic and you can't help but be optimistic as well when you hear him talk. But he's also very realistic about we haven't done enough as a society yet mm. to discuss the disruption that's coming in many different areas. And, and we need to do that more across disciplines. Yeah. And on that last note, I just keep revisiting his quote about this could be 10 times the impact and speed of the industrial revolution. And that sounds pretty grandiose, but I think that's really worth remembering because I hear from a lot of people that make the argument like, oh, you know, we had the industrial revolution, we had the internet revolution, we'll figure it out, we'll change, yeah. like we'll adapt. That's all true. I'm not saying you're wrong, but things can happen a lot faster and at a bigger scale really quickly that throw all the rules out the window. So yeah. I think it's worth considering speed and scale, not just the nature of disruption when you're thinking about how likely or unlikely it is. We're about to see some very strange times. Ahead. Yeah. So I'll grab one more excerpt. He said, I, uh, is there everything I ever dreamed of when she asked about like what it's like to be a part of this and like leading this? And he said, we're at the absolute frontier of science in so many ways, applied science as well as machine learning. And that's exhilarating as scientists know that feeling of being at the frontier and discovering something new for the first time. And that's happening almost on a monthly basis for us, which is amazing. But then, of course, we, meaning Shane and, and he and others who have been doing this for a long time, understand it better than anybody, the enormity of what's coming uh, and this thing about it's still under uh, actually appreciated, as, he, as we reference. In fact, what's going to happen in more of a 10-year timescale, including to things like the philosophical, what it means to be human, what's important about that, all these questions are going to come up and it's a big responsibility to be figuring these things out. But yeah, he's basically saying like, in the next 10 years, we're going to experience in essence, a hundred years of change. And mm -hmm. it's hard to prepare mentally for that and prepare as a society and prepare your business. And it's, again, that's why I say like, five-year plans and businesses other than like goals and vision of what you think is possible but the how you get there 
I, I don't really comprehend it. Like I laid out a five-year plan for our team recently. That's literally like one page of like, <laughs> right. here's where I think we're going to go. And here's like the steps we'll take to do it. But the reality is we're going to be reinventing this company every like six to 12 months, sometimes right. faster cycles because new things become possible that we couldn't have even done before. Like deep research, which I just said, we just hired a role for didn't exist when the year started. That's so and crazy. we're reimagining an entire <laughs> research firm around it. Unreal. I didn't even think that you're right. That, wow. It feels like it's this year's been five years long. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. 